Uh, once again, welcome to this uh, GIJN uh, webinar. We're focusing on data today, and of course there's mountains of it, and it's challenging to work with. Uh, but data journalism can fill out an incomplete story and also reveal hidden issues, so it's critical uh, that we are able to analyze published data, also find new data sources, and understand in general how to work with the numbers. And that's going to be our topic for today. Um, I'll introduce the speakers in a moment, uh, but for those of you who don't know us, a little bit about the Global uh, Investigative Journalism Network. Uh, we're the largest global network of nonprofit investigative journalism, nonprofit organizations in the world, and we currently have 184 member organizations in 77 countries. But we work with journalists everywhere in uh, commercial media, in nonprofits, and freelancers, and we were established to connect and to support them. Uh, related directly to this webinar, we've also recently launched a new resource guide, uh, which is called Investigating the Pandemic, a Guide to Sources of Data. We'll share that with you in the, in the chat box. It's a multi-part guide on where to obtain data about the spread of COVID-19 and its consequences. So check it out. Um, either you can see it in the chat box or either at GIJN.org. And today we have this uh, great presentation coming and we'll be sharing all the information uh, from the presentation for you both in the chat box again and uh, circulating it in the days to come. Uh, so now on to our speakers and I'm absolutely delighted that we've been joined by two leading uh, experts in data journalism uh, who will share their tips and strategies. Um, they're going to do a presentation shortly um, that will be about 45 minutes long and then we'll take questions. Giannina Sanini uh, heads the Data Concentration Program at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. While head of the investigative team at La Nación in Costa Rica, her team's investigations led to uh, prosecution of more than 50 politicians, businessmen, and public servants, including three former presidents. She's one of the five founding members as well of the Latin America Center for Investigative Journalism. It's called CLIP in, in Spanish and has received several international prizes for her work. Um, our second speaker, uh, Rigoberto Cavreal, is works at the same Latin America um, Center for Investigative Journalism at CLIP as well, and previously was the data expert for ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, where he worked on the Panama Papers and other major investigations. Um, among his projects was transforming ICIJ's offshore leaks database into an interactive web application, which led journalists and the public explore the secretive network of the offshore world. Uh, Rigoberto is a computer engineer by training and he has extensive experience in software development and database administration and analysis. So a, a huge welcome to both of them. We also want to hear from you in the audience um, and please send your written questions and messages uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll get to you as many as we can after the presentation. You can also send your questions in Russian and Arabic as well, and they'll be translated back for our speakers. And you can send questions anytime from now, of course. Uh, then when the speakers are finished, um, my GIJN colleague Majdalene Hassan will join us on screen to moderate the questions. Uh, uh, so um, as I said before, we'll share the presentation so you don't have to take rapid notes while you're watching this webinar. Um, you'll have this, the slides. And finally, please note that we are recording this session uh, for posting later on YouTube. So I think we can start. Giannina, over to you. And don't forget to unmute. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Anne, uh, Dave Kaplan, and all the production team for putting this together and, and for allowing us to share uh, different techniques on how to deal with data. Uh, we're definitely living unprecedented times. Uh, the world uh, gets disrupted every second, and never before data has, has, has been a better tool to try to make sense of this uh, rapidly changing world around us. 
Um, this is what's going to happen in the next uh, 45 minutes. We uh, we gave it a thought about what's the best way. You know, data could be an amazing tool to answer the most important questions that people have about this pandemic. Uh, some questions are about what about me? What's going to happen? I mean, what are my my risks? Uh, how is my neighborhood? Uh, you know, what's happening in, in, in my community? and also what's happening in the world. So uh, we're gonna show different techniques, six different techniques on how to use different data sources in different scenarios, uh, aggregated data or disaggregated data uh, to, find, to monitor uh, trends uh, and not just on how the pandemic is affecting uh, the health of uh, citizens, but also uh, other potential variables that are uh, affected by multi dimensions. So uh, geography is certainly an important part of this, but also evolution in time. Uh, so we're gonna be considering all these dimensions uh, as well as uh, other different sectors. As you might know by now, uh, all these, uh, uh, the, the evolution of this pandemic, it's not only affecting uh, health of, of people and citizens around the globe, but also other sectors. So it's important to keep in mind that, um, that data not only helps uh, uh, to understand, you know, the uh, seriousness of, uh, of the pandemic in any community around the world, but also other sectors such, such as the economy, uh, the supply chain and so on. So we're gonna be providing some examples, um, but the principles here are, uh, you know, what do we consider data uh, and what are the quality standards? Uh, the more we can get disaggregated data and anonymized data, the better. Uh, and this uh, I'm talking especially about uh, infections, uh, you know, in most of the cases we get aggregated data um, and not individual records of uh, uh, individual infections. But we need to try to uh, convince the governments to, to give us a more uh, detailed, complete, reliable, updated and historical data to better understand this phenomenon. Also, uh, ideally, it has to be accessible. I, I mean, this is the idea. I know that uh, it doesn't happen this way and uh, in every place, and that's why we consider the different scenarios. Now, what's the approach when we work with this data? Uh, of course, we have to be super skeptical. Uh, we know by now, and it has been proved that in many cases and in many countries around the world, uh, not all the infected people are counted. Uh, or, or the debt. So uh, we're going to be also showing some um, techniques to calculate uh, those uncounted debts. Um, and the other uh, disclaimer that is super important is that all the conclusions that we're going to present, uh, Rigoberto, he's a, a, a data scientist and, and he will be applying marketing techniques to uh, uh, understand the different variables involving uh, uh, infections. Uh, and all these calculations or correlations are just that. So correlation is not causation. Uh, and this is uh, uh, very important for everything that is coming next. Uh, when you see, uh, so each of the slides will have a tag, whether it's me, my community or the world, uh, and that's how you can uh, follow uh, the, the different scenarios that we created. So, Rigo. Hi. Yeah, uh, well, as you know, not all the government has open and rich data available for about um, the coronavirus disease. Uh, and we can, we can classify them uh, according to the granularity or level of the uh, of the data available. So uh, the first group is the set of countries that um, only publishes global figures. It is it is very difficult to make decisions or inspect uh, the government measures or or, or the government uh, job uh, if you only have some some numbers that maybe are not even reliable. Maybe um, so. 
this is this is there are there is a group of countries in this case uh, the second group is confirmed by the countries that even they have beautiful dashboards with informative data um, but it is not downloadable the data is not downloadable so this cannot be recognized as open data because it is it is not reusable or downloadable or it is it is not in a in a friendly format okay so the the third group represent represents the list of countries uh, that present a uh, frequent and uh, frequently aggregated data uh, this is the most common case um, uh, you can work with with this kind of data and get interesting analysis and um, now we can we can i can i will show you some examples of what we can do with this but um, you cannot get deeper knowledge from 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 this kind of data because the the best the best way to get um, richer visualization or extract really important knowledge uh, from the data sets are um, the, the 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 data that is uh, granular but we we can individual records um, for each patient with with very in uh, rich details about about every case uh, so mining data like, data like this is the best way to extract um, more knowledge and learn from and learn about this uh, pandemic uh, i only know uh, three countries that provides uh, data like this very granular data and um, they are mexico and um, that um, this is very rich um, and then we have colombia and peru and also it will be terrific if you can tell us about um, more data sources like like this one like a granular with the granular data um, okay next um, I want to I wanted to provide you with my secret weapon uh, for data processing um, uh, which is a uh, ETL software what is, what is ETL software um, there are uh, so this is this is a kind of software that allows you to um, develop jobs uh, that extract data from a data source, transform the data um, in, in the format that you want, and then you can uh, load to a visualization or a database um, for the, that in the format that you that you want. Uh, so this is this is very useful because it, it, it allows you to save hours or days of programming um, in in this in this uh, in in this task so if you have a data data dashboard or or data visualizations it is very important to automate to automatize um, all these transformations so you can you will you will not be doing manual manual uh, data input um, uh, so um, this this is this this will be a really important change in your process um, if you use the software like this i use a uh, talent open studio for data uh, for data integration it is an open source software and and it really saved me hours or days of, of programming time okay next um so uh, us journalists um have to provide useful information to the audience so that everyone one could make accurate decisions uh, and help them to monitor the government job. So this is a list of of topics that we can we should be monitoring every day. Uh, so we can we can we will be able to to check and inspect uh, all the all the job that or 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 understand this this phenomenon. Uh, so we can uh, obviously um, check the confirmed positive cases and um, check the, the death re recovery the test now uh, um, later I want to show you some visualization about the, the tests that we can do and we have to um, very important to check the graphical distribution and progress uh, of the cases and detect uh, infection clusters and it, it inspect the, the hospitalization ch changes um, um, understand the patient's origins and um, also inspect the transfers to the hospital, the availability of, of ICUs or usages, 
and and the effects of the Hello. Okay. Um, then this is this is a visualization that that allow us to to inspect the test. Uh, so we can we have here in red uh, the positive cases uh, by day by date. Um, so uh, and in the, in the green bar is um, the green column is our negative cases, and the the gray line shows you the the number of of uh, tests applied this day. Uh, so with with a graph like this, we can we can. Um, uh, uh, inspect the job that the the authorities are doing, the health authorities are doing to uh, find suspected cases of of of, of coronavirus. That is, this is something that all, um, we we should do in a phase three um, spread of the pandemic. Um, so okay, next the next one is is uh, the same the same thing, but um, in, uh, we can see here the proportion um, of the positive cases uh, versus the, the, the negative cases. So um, this, this is, uh, we, 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 it is very important to, to, to check every day to monitor how this proportion is changing so, so that we can, we can that, um, React, react, or or understand that how how the 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 problem is is getting um, worse uh, or not. Um, okay, next. Okay, I cannot see everything. Um, okay, this is another example of visualization that that we can run with aggregated data. Um, so we have we have we have here the the number of active cases versus uh, the uh, the hosp hospitalizations. Um, so um, this is all as as I told you as I, is to inspect uh, what is being doing or what is happening with the hospitalizations. For example, here in Costa Rica, the last two weeks, uh, the number of active cases has been uh, going up, uh, but the the hospitalization is in the in the uh, the behavior of the hospitalization have, have, hasn't changed. Uh, so um, now that that it, it has been going going up for the last two weeks, we we expect a, a different behavior for for the hospitalization, and this is something that we will be. Um, this is something that that will we will be. Um, um, is um, monitoring what is going to hap happen with with this. Are they uh, is this hospitalization uh, grow and the cases uh, grow or 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 if not, um, it is because of uh, because of uh, there is a new a a new, there is a treatment that is being using to to keep the people in in their houses or or. Well, there are, there are a lot of, of questions that, that we can um, ask um, with che by, by checking this, this, this behavior. Okay, and uh, next. Okay, um, another very important and very uh, uh, demanded uh, visualization is the behavior by city and, and the progress, not only numbers, the 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 evolution by in in the time of of the cases is is very important for people to check to understand how how my neighborhood is doing how badly is my neighborhood doing um, so it is this will allow you to not only to um, to make decisions on on how to um, take care um, or or or, or even um, it, it will allow you to detect on time new new um, um, infection clusters. So um, it is it is this is something that is is very important. As you as you can see in the in the visualization, we have this city in the red line that has been going up for the next for the last two weeks, um, and and and. It, um, 
with with a technique like that that I, I'm going to explain uh, now in the next in the next um, slide um, is a technique to detect new uh, new cluster new top clusters. Um, can you can you go next? To the, yeah. Okay. So we we have we have behaviors like um, uh, we we have different. Uh, uh, slopes in this in these charts. So uh, if we can uh, calculate uh, the um, a, a trend line for the last for the last five or seven days uh, of every line of every re region, uh, so we can calculate um, the the, uh, the the slope and um, and detect in time this this um, important changes for every region in in and recognize them as as new um, in um, growing growing infections uh, re regions um, so what what I'm doing here is I calculate the trend line this is something that you can do easily in tableau you can you can um, generate the, the 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 lines visualization and um, and and generate trend lines and if you um select the option to describe the models uh, then you 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 can get these values here the slopes um so you can collect them and 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 order order them by by the slope and also, you can use uh, something in, in Excel uh, to transform this decimal value to to a fraction. So just 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 what you have to do is only change the format of the number. You you can choose a custom format like this one in, 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 um, with the ask questions and and a common denominator like um, eight or or sixteen or whatever. Uh, so this way you will have um, the rate with the with the with a common number of days. Um, so this fraction can be interpreted by approximately uh, 55 cases every eight days or nine cases every eight days. And you have a very uh, easy way to compare to help people to understand uh, how um, severe is the uh, the behavior of each region. Okay. Um, okay, that's that's some ex examples that you can do with uh, with aggregated data. But um, uh, the the best way to really extract knowledge, as I say, is working with granular data. When you have case cases by case records um, in your data set, and in Mexico, for example, has very rich open data with more than one. One um, one hundred and thousand um, one hundred twenty thousand records of anonymous patients containing data like this, like the geographical information, symptoms, risk factors, age, sex, hospitalization date, medical treatment, occupation, nationality, um, um, symptoms, uh, vaccines, and contact with animals. All all of these. Um, details you you have for every single patient um in in the in mexico for from the mexico city for example um, so yeah this is this is very very rich um and, and we some things that we can do is um calculate the uh, coronavirus infection risk by um uh, by um According, uh, depending on the on the on the risk factors, say the 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 data looks like this one, like like this image. Okay, you have um, uh, all all the details about every person, the age, the sex, the the all the the risk factors, and if the patient was hospitalized or not, um, if it if he or she required um, an ICU unit, an ICU. Uh, or if the patient died. So with data like this, you can um, extract, we, we, you can um, understand how the, the risk, these risk factors um, are, are, are affecting to people or, the, or the, the, how, how, how um, 
important is the risk is is the 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 the, the risk factor. So um, in the next slide, uh, okay, this is something that I am I have been doing um, in data mining. We have we have a technique uh, named uh, association roles, uh, and this is used uh, by in the, in the marketing to um, uh, understand the probability that a customer uh, buys um, an item given that uh, the, the customer bought another item or another set of items. So I'm using this technique to, um, uh, to understand uh, the, the probability that the, the a patient is, um, is hospitalized or a or the patient will require an ICU or the patient uh, the, pro the probability the the patient could die given the patient um, the patient's factors the patient's risk factors uh, for example here uh, we have um, ordered in uh, by the column two uh, this data set when we have the probability of being hospitalized given that the patient has these factors. So the probability that a, 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 a patient is um, could be hospitalized, given that um, the patient has a chronic kidney disease, is a seven, seven, 69 percent. This is according to the Mexi Mexica, uh, Mexico data, um, and he, here we have the percentage of the total positive cases with uh, these factors okay that has have been hospitalized so this is our um, these are two different metrics and um, i have seen very articles that only are using this this metric uh, the percentage of total positive cases with this with with factors and that have been hospitalized and yes it, it is it is very important because it, it um it allow allow us to know how frequent is the 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 factor the risk factor and how the people is being hospitalized but the most important uh, metric is is this one the probability of die or requires an icu given that uh, you have this risk factor and so these are these are these are the formulas for to calculate this uh, and this is very very interesting because when you order by this metric um, um this is something that i haven't uh, read so much but uh, with using the 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 mexican data um it is this is telling me that the chronic kidney disease is 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 a, a higher risk uh, than it, um all of all of this one um and then we have the age if the patient have, has these ranges of for the, for the age um they could have 66 percent of of probability of being hospitalized um next so um i i i, I we are we are sharing this code this is our code to generate the association rules um, so uh, we, um, I shared the, the the data set, and with a line like this, like like this one, um, you can um, um, generate uh, the association rules with a confidence or the probability of um, 90, 95 percent as minimum, um, and a combination of maximum of five factors. Okay, and and then you can filter all the all the all the roles generated uh, because you are you could be only interested in 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 the roles um, uh, to calculate um, the pay, uh, the probability to be hospitalized or die or whatever. Um, okay. So um, when you when you run this algorithm, uh, then you can. You can get more than um, individual risk factors. You can get combination of risk factors. So uh, we have here uh, that the, com the the combination of factors are ha has um, worse prob probability to be of being hospitalized. So if you have, for example, asthma, chronic kidney disease, smoking, 
um, and and your age is between these values, um, then there there is according to the data uh, that 100 probability of being hospitalized, um, and oh, and in the same way for all this combination that we that we can see here. Okay. Next. Uh, so this is this, the same thing, but I, um, I'm calculating the probability to die given the the, the risk factors. Uh, so these are the 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 um, lethal combination of risk factors. Um, so uh, if you have in the first line, um, you have the uh, the six, 67 percent of probability to die. Um, given that you have cardiovascular diseases or chronic kidney disease and you smoke and your age is between these values so um these are these are the values for the for these factors and also um we can we can generate the individual risk factors um in the in the table in the bottom table um Yes. Uh, something very important is that um, in, we can detect in the rules and using the algorithm that I'm using this time in this in this slide is that the age is the most important um, feature or or not feature um, the attribute the um, that. Um, uh, that, that can determine uh, the, the, all the, the probabilities to die or to being hospitalized or whatever. Um, so this is this is a, um, an algorithm. Here is the the R code. Um, uh, this is the the G, G square test. Um, this this is to um, uh, to test uh, the statistical the independence or association between two or more uh, categorical variables okay um, so this is not like like a regret um, uh, a correlation it's just is something similar to our correlation but with for a correlation you require you you, you need um, numerical values but when you with, you don't have numerical values you can you can use this test the kind of test to um, determine the association between these these um, variables okay so yeah the conclusion here is that in, and this uh, visualization um, uh, allow us to see it uh, that the uh, the most important um, variable is the age. So we we are using he here the Mexican data, um, and this is the distribution by age. Uh, um, so I cannot see everything. Um, so we can see that the 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 central value of all the positive cases um, is different from the central value of all the people that has been hospitalized so uh, this 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 is um, telling us that the older you are the more likely is that you will need um, the, you will need a hospitalization and it is very clear in this visualization okay next um, uh, this is this is um, another another visualization here is this is the Data from Colombia. Colombia also has has um, a granular data, so um, we can we have here the the age um, below, and and uh, um, and the colors are uh, the status of the patient. So um, the the orange um, columns are uh, the people who died. Um, so yeah, there is no doubt that. Uh, the, elder, the elderly people um, uh, are more likely to die. Um, so uh, also we have here in, in blue the asymptomatic cases. Uh, so this is the, the contrary. You see, um, so this, this distribu distribution is very, very, uh, this is very clear. Um, saying us that the, the age is very important is a very important attribute and the best way to classify it, the risk um okay next 
this is another example of visualization that you can do, you can do with, with, um, with granular data. Uh, and it is very important to inspect um, uh, the, the people that is dying at home because there are a, a very high percentage of the people are classified as, as ambulatory patients. Uh, so it is very important to monitor uh, um, the number of, of, of people that is, is, is dying and they, 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 uh, they are not being uh, hospitalized. So um, yeah, very important to take into account and to, to check every day. Um, also, we have here um, how long how long did the positive uh, patient last before they die? Uh, so we have here uh, the central a central value about uh, seven seven days. So uh, this is like the uh, the central value uh, uh, for the, the the number of days that the patient um, 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 are um, last before they die. Okay. So and and we have here. Uh, sorry, I uh, back go back. Um, something very important is that uh, we need to um, also monitor the the ambulatory cases um, because if they are if they are at home and only we all um, um, the central value are are seven days, so they don't have. Uh, they, they, these people require to to be uh, uh, very a, a very um, 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 very important uh, action to be uh, monitored. Uh, so uh, this is this is this is something that we we really need to pay attention to. Okay. And another and another idea that we can um, can show you is that it is very important um, after after this uh, pandemic, after this phenomenon, we we have to learn about about this about what happened on every country. Um, so it is very important that we register and evaluate all the con contingency uh, measures. Um, that were applied for every for every country. So we we this way we we will learn about what are the best way to to deal with this. Uh, so here is an example of of the measures that were applied in Costa Rica um, by date. Uh, so yeah. So this, this all these all these uh, measures all these contingency measures um, allow us to keep keep it in control in the number of cases. Uh, but then we, we, we had to reactivate the economy. And, and then um, uh, we, after phase one of the reactivation and phase two, this is going, going up. Um, but we have to, the, the idea is that we have to do um, this with every country because every country is like a lot, a, a, a different laboratory with with different decisions and different behaviors. Uh, so um, we, as as journalists, should be collecting all this information and and later um, get conclusions about uh, how the how the measures um, uh, did, uh, and and then we we will be better prepared for for the next waves or or the next pandemic okay yeah that that's are the, the examples thank you Rigo. and this is really really important uh, so this is a combination of uh, you know having all this data um, on infections and the evolution over time uh, plotting uh, the different measures so that we can see the effect that they had um, now I was just thinking when I was uh, listening to you that uh, that this is something that some uh, media organizations have tried. Uh, for instance, the classic case, cases are you know Sweden with uh, with this particular model of um, uh, uh, less restrictions, and other countries in in the same region doing the opposite. Um, now this is something we we're going to see until the end. Now this thing is a, it's just starting as we know by now. So it, that's why it's important to keep this uh, data updated. 
Okay, so uh, there's a, a, a Rigo showed you, you know, different things you could do, uh, whether you have um, granular data or aggregated data, which is uh, uh, most of the cases. Um, but we know, we know that not all the cases are being counted. That is a fact that has been uh, proved in, in many regions and countries. Uh, they are not counted because many people die at home uh, or because they were not tested. And so depending on the country's policies, some countries are including only uh, positive te uh, tested people. Um, also, it could be because the reporting systems and methods are inadequate or inaccurate um, to actually reveal the, 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 the real scenario. Um, and also because, as you know, you know, people get sick all, all the time with or without pandemic. So many people are scared to go to the hospitals uh, and they could have died or have complications because they uh, were avoiding hospitals uh, uh, and they didn't want to get infected. Now, how do we deal with this? Uh, so there is a, a methodology that allows you to calculate what it's been called excess mortality. Uh, the excess mortality, this is the formula. Um, to calculate this, you need to have previous deaths uh, on anything, all the statistics about people who died during the same period of time in previous years. So if we now want to calculate the excess uh, mortality for, uh, let's say, the first four months uh, of 2020, uh, so we need, we need to calculate it in, in this way. We have the total mortality. Now, this is the, the trick here. You need to have updated data on mortality in general. Uh, so if you have that for the first four months, you can uh, simply subtract um, the average. You could represent it in absolute numbers or also in a, as, a, as a percentage. Uh, so you can get the absolute numbers of, uh, of people who die in excess in comparison with the previous uh, years uh, for the same period of time. Uh, so the more years, previous years you have, the better uh, the, the calculation is because now this is how the World Health Organization defines success mortality is, you know, mortality above, above what uh, would be expected based on non-crisis mortality rate in the population. Uh, now, the, with this formula, you can do, you can calculate it in any country. Now, the problem is not all the countries have this uh, data, um, updated and, 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 and reliable, of course. Um, so uh, I got obs uh, uh, obsessed with the, the mortality access because um, certainly this is a way to approach data in a critical way, like knowing that, that the numbers we're, we're getting from our governments are not accurate. Uh, so it's a way to dig into the data and like, find out or try to estimate how that works. So, uh, as far as I know, and I, there are three major publications that have been tracking data um, to calculate the excess mortality. Uh, the Economist is this. Uh, you have all the links in the document that we're going to um, uh, give you after the, the webinar. Uh, but they calculated it for many uh, uh, European countries and um, New York City and uh, Jakarta and Istanbul. Um, and it's exactly the same methodology. As you can see, you can, it's been represented by uh, absolute numbers. You know, usually, uh, for instance, in Britain, uh, you have uh, 50,000 deaths. That was like the normal uh, number across uh, the same uh, periods over the years. Uh, and then when you subtract, when you subtract this to the actual deaths in 2020, you see that there's an increase. Um, so this is a way that, of course, is not 100% accurate. But th there's something important. I mean, this calculation is including all these people who, uh, who died as a result of the pandemic and not necessarily because of the virus. As I said before, you know, people who didn't go to the hospital, people who didn't get a surgery and, and so on. Uh, the Financial Times did the same thing for 14 countries. Uh, 
and they came to the conclusion that uh, you know global coronavirus death toll could be 60 percent higher than reported. Uh, again, following the same methodology. And the New York Times has uh, open data in GitHub uh, for 25 countries. So they started calculating this for the US where we know uh, they, they had the same problem. So people were not even um, accepted in hospital. So they went back to their homes and died. Um, and, and so all these people are not counted. Uh, the, Times, the Times was able to get uh, mortality data for 25 countries and they cleaned the data. Uh, so you can go to GitHub and, uh, and get all this data for these 25 countries. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's the same formula. Now, uh, fortunately, uh, there are a group of scientists who are aware of this even before the pandemic started. And they have been uh, collecting and tracking mortality data all across the world. Uh, now, because of the, uh, of the pandemic, their efforts increased. And now they have mortality data for 41 countries. Uh, you feel free to go and check it and check this website. Um, they, I, I included also all the, the data availability. You can download the mortality data and calculate uh, the excess mortality for your own country, your own region. Okay, so uh, this is something kind of new, uh, which is mobility data. Uh, I'm sure that you have seen in, in, in that different um, uh, scientists have been modeling data to forecast, you know, what's going to happen. Uh, all the, uh, um, and they are not only considering measures uh, applied by the governments, they're also considering the infection rates. Uh, but there's a tool that has been helping scientists across the world and journalists as well to really understand what people, how people are be behaving. Uh, so, you know, all the um, uh, cell phone operators across the world more and more have been giving up an, um, anonymized data on how people are moving. As you, as you know, every time we carry our cell phone, we, uh, the cell phone is sending signals to the operator. Uh, so every minute, every five minutes or, or so. Uh, and so that means that they keep track of where we are. Uh, now, uh, this is super scary, I have to say, uh, because uh, that means that they know where you are, etc. But as, assuming that that, uh, that that is the fact, uh, at least they are using this data for the good. And so tech companies and operators have been giving away their data to governments and to uh, international organizations to see how people are moving. Now, um, there are different metrics that you can use. Like, how, what do you do with all these giant data sets of, uh, set of people moving from one place to the other? There are different ways to do it. So uh, here, I, I, I spent some time uh, digging into the different sources that, uh, that you can use to download this data and see how people are moving in your own countries. Um, so the most important project is called COVID-19 Mobility Data Network. And this is a group of epidemiologists at universities around the world uh, that have an agreement with uh, mobile operators uh, and tech companies uh, such as Facebook, Google, or Apple. Uh, so what they're doing is that they're curating all these data and, um, and calculating metrics. So for instance, one of the metrics is number of people who travel more than one kilometer a day. Uh, and then you have location points, you know, coordinates where you can see where people were going and then identify patterns uh, in, in a map. Uh, so all of these data, I mean, some of it is, uh, like the ones in the bottom are companies, uh, private companies that also have access to these data. So for instance, Descartes Labs, has some of these data available for the U.S. The Scarpus Lab is just for the U.S. The, uh, the first one is uh, global. Um, Terralytics has information about many countries. So let me show you a couple of examples of, of the kind of stories that you can do using this, this data. Uh, oh, 
before, let me just tell you, this is amazing. This is the first time you have the three giant tech companies sharing mobility data. So uh, um, I use the three of them. Uh, it, it depends also if your country is more Facebook oriented or Google oriented, but in general, if you combine these three sources, you have, you can download uh, from Google and this is the way they do it. Every time you use Google Maps or Apple Maps to go, uh, to, you know, go from one place to the other, they keep track of, uh, of, of those uh, movements uh, from point A to point B. Um, how do they know that? Well, because again, uh, once you search for an address or, or directions, uh, they can combine this with the actual signals that your phone is sending. Uh, again, I mean, they claim that this is all anonymized data. I mean, your, your name is not there, but, uh, but, if, but, but you're definitely being represented in this data if you're using one of these uh, devices. Um, uh, the Google data is, is, uh, is classified even by locations. So they tell you if people are going to the pharmacy or if they're going to the supermarket or if they're going to a park. Uh, so that kind of detail you can get from the Google data and it's pretty much for all over the world. Uh, same with Google, uh, with Apple Maps. And then uh, Facebook has a project uh, now with, uh, with the COVID-19 crisis that it's called Data for Good. Uh, and so they uh, um, partnered with uh, data, humandata.org. Uh, and if you go, I mean, I, I checked the Latin American data and it's really, really uh, impressive. Now, let me show you the kind of things you can do. For instance, the New York Times used the uh, data from Descartes Lab, that it's uh, primarily US data based on all the operators in, uh, in the US. Uh, and one of the stories they did is that they were able to, to see, you know, how the richest neighborhoods were emptied um, out uh, as coronavirus hit New York City. Um, and so the, well, this, is a, this is a story that shows how, you know, low income um, places were, uh, were not as emptied as, as, as the rich neighborhoods. So this is, this is an angle that you can, I mean, there are many things, many ways in, you, in which you can think about, you know, how to use mobility data. Uh, this is another example from Germany using um, uh, Terralytics uh, the, uh, data. This is, again, a company that collects information from European um, operators. So here you can see how, um, uh, well, it's in German. I tried my best to uh, translate it, uh, it, it with, with the translation, uh, translator. But, uh, but basically what this story is showing is that uh, what P uh, Rigo was saying before, you know, you have measures that are implemented. And then another thing is to see if people are really obeying and if they, uh, uh, following the instructions. So at, at a cer certain point in time, uh, you know, you, you could see how particular regions were not um, following the instructions uh, and, and that they were going anywhere they wanted despite uh, the restrictions. Uh, so with mobility data, there's so much more that you can do. Uh, I really invite you to go and check the tip sheet that we prepared. Uh, it has literally uh, dozens of uh, uh, global resources uh, for for, to get mobility data beyond the ones I just showed. All right, so there's another, the, another methodology, methodology that you can use to create knowledge. And well, uh, the funny thing that we were saying at the beginning of this webinar is, you know, you can treat the, the pandemic as, as a business problem and apply all the marketing tools and metrics that Rigo was showing to understand uh, in real time what's happening with your community. So this is an idea that you can perfectly apply in your own country, doesn't matter where it is, as long as you have some public records available and updated. Uh, so, so dashboards are a, a, a really good way uh, for data scientists over time and business people who make decisions just by taking a look at the different uh, um, variables and how they're beha behaving. Um, 
so uh, actually this is a project that I'm starting with my uh, next class of data students. Um, uh, we want to collect, uh, we want to collect, uh, the, oh, this is the concept. This is just a representation, forget about the numbers are not real, but this is just for you to know, you, you know, what do we have in mind? Uh, yes, the, the uh, pandemic is affecting, uh, uh, obviously, the health of citizens around the world, but then you have other things happening as a result. So, you know, if you really think about your community, you know, what are the important things in your community? I mean, there, there's obviously unemployment happening, uh, infections as well, but then you have also domestic violence uh, and mental health issues and increase or you know al alcohol consumption that is going up and up and up as you uh, as you know so these are like ordinary life changes so that's how i call it like you can create your own dashboard of ordinary life changes in your community and and not just the community you can do the same for different countries or different regions so for instance imagine that you have a dashboard i mean this is uh, th these are different charts from different you know bbc or different publications uh, it's not a real dashboard, but, but um, the concept here is how to combine all these variables that obviously have different scales and different numbers, but if you can standardize and show in the dashboard, you know, what's happening, uh, and again, using uh, automation, you don't need to go manually and download the numbers every day. You can, as, as, as he was saying before, you can use tools like Talent Open Studio to automatically download this, da uh, this data from, let's say, 10 different sensitive indicators or variables, uh, such as, uh, I don't know, traffic tickets, arrests, food prices, you know, the markup, um, which is a, a, a new startup, a data journalism startup, they have been doing an amazing job using algorithms to track the, uh, Amazon prices and, and, and showing, you know, how they went up uh and exposing you know people who are benefiting from 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 this crisis so so there are different variables people who are taken out of their homes because they cannot pay i mean this is going to start happening right away uh in the society and the, and the concept here is listen your grandchildren will be talking about pre and post covid 19 era this is definitely changing where we're witnessing a historical situation here so the logic using data is you know how was the world before the pandemic and now let's see how it's changing rapidly in real time now why do we want to do this kind of stuff if we see that there's like a serious increase in any of these sensitive ordinary life uh, indicators uh, we uh, of course that could be a lead for uh, in-depth story and also to keep governments to account and see if they are covering all this uh, spectrum of different uh, um, changes that are occurring in, in our societies. Uh, and finally, you know, you have the world. Uh, the, uh, so data can help us to explain not just my individual problem and, 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 and risk factors, uh, that community as a whole, but also you can, I mean, there's so much data that you can use and these are just some ideas on the kind of topics that you can monitor. Obviously, health patterns across countries, as, as Rigo was saying, you know, comparing Sweden with Finland and New Zealand and other countries that don't have, that have different measures. Then, uh, and then the environment, you know, uh, I know that it seems like kind of suspended the discussion on the environment because we're all focused on the pandemic, but, uh, but there's so many things happening right now that, uh, you know, bad actors are taking advantage of the fact that we are all distracted uh, in the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so, I mean, something that we know, but that hasn't been measured is, you know, all the illegal timber exports that are coming out of Peru and the Amazon, um, deforestation, deregulation, trade of animal species. I mean, that's a serious stuff. Uh, you know, uh, live animals are traded over the world with like few restrictions. So uh, there is data, statistical data uh, for every country to monitor what's happening. And obviously, you know, the impact in organized crime, in transnational crime, uh, you know, drug smuggling, illegal trade, human trafficking and corruption are still 
happening, but they are changing routes and they are changing <coughs> uh, methodologies. So that's something we can also monitor. And then the disruption of supply chain and international trade. You know, there are dramatic changes in the shipping industry, airlines, export bans, travel restrictions. So um, let me just show an example of uh, something that we, we just finished with my uh, students. I teach a class that is called Using Data to Investigate Across Borders. So one of the groups was uh, trying to understand the trade of ventilators. You know, ventilators are crucial to keep, uh, uh, to save lives, uh, people who have respiratory uh, uh, crisis as a result of the virus. So what we did is we identified the, uh, the HS code or the customs code for ventilators and components of ventilators. And then we mapped all the, you know, the countries that are producing ventilators around the world. Let me tell you, it's such a mess. Why? Because it's totally organized in a normal, uh, um, in a normal uh, uh, free trade environment. Now, uh, uh, countries like Mexico, Costa Rica, um, Romania, um, and many other countries are producing parts of ventilators that are essential. So just to give you an example, you know, uh, in Switzerland, there are two major, I mean, there are few companies uh, fabricating or ma uh, manufacturing ventilators in the world. Uh, two of them are in Switzerland, but they need these components from third countries. And because of the export bans, uh, they were not flowing as they should. Now, the Mexican case was very interesting because Mexico turns out to be the third major producer of ventilators in the world. And not just ventilators, but parts of ventilators. What happens is, that this is all happening in a regime, in a tax regime, a free tax uh, zone regime, which means that the US, mo mostly US companies that are producing this because of the labor is cheaper in Mexico. Um, and according to that law, the, these items, I mean, the ventilators have to be exported. They cannot be used in the country. So the, the irony of this story is not about wrongdoing, it's about how crazy was the world that we were living in that Mexico is sacrificing their employees. Um, and actually the, the factories are located in the border with the US in Tijuana, Mexicali, Baja California. Uh, so all these, I mean, this is one of the major uh, infections focus in, in, in the country. So these people are getting sick and they are dying to produce ventilators that are mostly going to the US or other places. And at the same time, the government is trying to buy. So we did this using procurement data. Uh, the, the government is paying three to four times the real cost of ventilators with all sorts of corruption deals um, because they cannot use what they, uh, they themselves produce. This is just an example of the kind of things you can do using um, uh, using international trade data. Uh, oh, I mean, oh, UN Comtrade has aggregated data. Uh, this is uh, the United Nations Statistic Department. So you can download data by any kind of item or commodity uh, over the years since 1965. Uh, and it, this is totally for free, but it's aggregated data. Now, if you want to get the detail of who is importing or exporting what, Unfortunately, there are few countries in the world that has this, uh, have this data open, mostly all of them in Latin America, um, uh, at least eight countries in Latin America, Peru, Colombia, Costa Rica, etc., have this information online and open. And some other countries you can get the data from commercial platforms that are a bit expensive, such as Pangeva, Datamine, or Evo Genius. Uh, so, uh, this raw data tells you, you know, who was the importer, who was the exporter, the price, the uh, weight, uh, description of the goods. Now, assuming that you get this information for your own region or country, there's so many things you can do and ideas to cover transnational uh, uh, stories. And here, I really want to be emphatic. I know that we are all worried about what's going to happen to me. Can I go out? Is it too bad in my neighborhood? That's, um, that's a, a major concern, of course. But there are so many things happening across borders uh, that are not being monitored. Um, for instance, you know, uh, of course, tracking all these mess of uh, medical equipment and overpricing. Uh, 
then you can like as i was saying before you can track illegal timber from the amazon and there it's growing at rates that never before we saw because uh it's easier now there's less supervision in on the field uh trade of live animals uh chemical precursors you know that there are some very supposedly controlled chemical precursors how are they flowing across countries during the pandemic uh and, and then you can also think about you know uh, north korea um iran and venezuela you know what's happening with these countries that are under sanctions uh at that at this moment so monitoring monitoring trade in and out of these countries is, is another potential uh, data technique that you can use to find potential stories. Uh, and again, I mean, how is organized crime adapting to uh, and changing trade routes uh, during the crisis? So one thing uh, on this, you can manually collect all the seizures and see changes uh, uh, from, from before the pandemic. Um, so we compiled a, a comprehensive list of global data resources, story ideas and story examples. And also Rigo was so generous that he shared, for those of you who know how to program or want to know how to program, he shared all the code that he used and the algorithms uh, to calculate um, what he showed. Uh, so everything you can find it in, um, oh well, of course you cannot click what I say here, but and, 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 and the GIJN team will be sharing the, the link with you guys. Thank you very much for, for your patience and, and... Thank you. Thanks both of you. That was great. And thanks for sharing all that, that, that wealth of material, which we of course will make available. Uh, it's really fascinating. And also thanks for, thanks for the uh, granular detail, but also for all the great story ideas. So, and there's, I know there's a lot of questions, so I want to go to my colleague Madeline and, um, and she's been following the questions coming in. So I think we've got about three rounds. Madge, do you want to start? Yeah. Thanks. Hi everyone. Actually, we've received uh, uh, plenty of questions. I have the, the three, the first three questions for Janina. Uh, the first question is, um, they want you to tell them about the recommended international data sets for internationals who work under limited data access. This is the first question. The second question is, um, what is the best strategies to deal with missing data on data sheets? The third one, how to best visualize the difference between the increasing confirmed cases as a country's testing capacity increases versus increasing confirmed cases due to different uh, contingency can, can, measures. Can we go one by one? Because I already forgot the first. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes. I'm too old. <laughs> it's so, yes. so Madge, do you want to repeat the first one? It's on data sets. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. OK. So yeah, of course. I mean, the good news about the bad news <laughs> is that yes, uh, some governments are not presenting reliable information. I mean, the, uh, if you don't have mortality data, and if we're talking about monitoring the evolution of uh, the pandemic in your own country, and if you don't have reliable infections uh, data, and if you don't have mortality data, then it's a bit complicated. Now, there are so many things, as, again, uh, as I was, I, I wish I can show you, but uh, if you go to this uh, uh, mobility data, there's so much you can do to, uh, to see what's happening um, in your own country. The, uh, so all of these mobility the, uh, data sources, and that's why I, I really wanted to show you this uh, uh, precisely because I'm aware of the fact that not all countries have uh, data and some countries don't have data at all. So, you know, if you go there, uh, every single country, you have a data set for your own country that you can plot and see you know, how people are moving across your country, where are they going? You can use this and the measures, you know, manually co collect the measures that your government is applying uh, to see uh, the correlation between, I mean, are, are, are people following? Um, or you can combine this mobility data also integrated with infections data and see if you know, if you have just the uh, information by, I don't know, province or by uh, city or, or states, if it's a federal government, uh, if you have infections data on that, and you can you can correlate the mobility data with with um, 
with infections data to see, uh, you know, how people are following. The, now, the other thing is like, obviously you don't have to, you, to treat or, or use these data sources as, as the ultimate uh, reality uh, thing. You know, uh, not everybody uses Google Maps, not everybody has Google at all. Um, so the, the, my advice is go and explore uh, this document. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Uh, in this document, you can see for each uh, country, uh, so it's a long document, but it has the links to all the uh, uh, different data sources. This, uh, he, oh, sorry, it went off. Um, anyways, you can check it out. Uh, they will distribute it, but there are many other sources in, in there. The, uh, the second question was, uh, what, uh, they, what are the best strategies to deal with missing data and unclean data sheets? Yeah, uh, Rigo can, can jump here as well because uh, he's the uh, data scientist, but um, what I do most of the time is like I test the data. I sort it out, it, uh, it's very simple, descending. If you sort the data and you see that there are some gaps in, in time, for instance, you have data for uh, uh, you know, the entire year, but two months are missing. So w one thing to do is check if there are dates that are missing. Uh, what can you do with that? Uh, well, of course you can keep struggling and dealing with, you know, public authorities and demand for reliable, accurate information. Um, if not, you know, my best, uh, my best advice is for countries, and, and believe me, I have worked in, in Timor-Leste, Myanmar, and I know exactly what you're dealing with, uh, that there's pretty much nothing. So that's why international data sets and international, um, there are other different models that scientists are using to monitor the situation in places where the data is not available. So go and check international data sources if you don't trust your government's uh, uh, data, um, but also try to make sense of this data that you have. Uh, first, identifying gaps and uh, trying to fill them out. Um, also dealing with experts in your own country uh, as well, uh, who could be developing different models uh, to estimate the missing data. Uh, I don't know, Rigo, if you have anything else to add to yeah. this. Yeah, and this is something that you always have to do. You have to amplify your data before running any analysis with it. Uh, so you can determine uh, how complete is, 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 is your data. And you have to, you have to check how, how, how many records are missing or, or how many uh, records of, of a column is, is missing. Um, if you have a, a significant um, sample, maybe you can, you can, you can use it, uh, but you have, to, you have to discard records that, have the, the, uh, that doesn't have the, the values. Um, um, yeah, yeah that, that would be my recommendation. If you have a significant record set, just discard, discard the record that doesn't have the values. Yeah, uh, and the third one was? One, how to best visualize the difference between the increasing confirmed cases as countries testing capacity increases versus increasing confirmed cases due to different contingency measures like lockdown. Rigo, you want to go on this one? Um, well, yeah, this definitely the, the, the number of confirmed cases is, is, is not reliable at all. And so um, I think that um, this is the even well the the, the confirmed cases are, are not um, are um, easy to 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 get a ground number, but it is more difficult to hide uh, the number of dead dead people. Uh, maybe if if these numbers are not reliable, you can. Sooner or later, the number of deaths will, will be known, uh, so uh, this, this this values can be can be um, can be used to to determine the behavior of of the, of the phenomenon in your in your country. Yeah. 
Uh, there's also, yeah. also a discussion about, uh, and I, I think the question has to do with this as well. Where, uh, you know, you have listened to many politicians across the world saying, oh no, the numbers are going up because we're testing more people. Um, so that's tricky, you know, if, uh, and it's true. Like if you have more, if you're testing more people, definitely you, you're, the numbers are gonna go up. And that's one of the things that certain countries are using uh, to manipulate manipulate the, uh, the the reality and and just not testing is is good for politics you know now how do you know if the number of tests that are being uh, applied uh, if the increase is uh, caused because they are uh, testing more it's it, it's hard to know because again you know you can have for instance uh, let me give you the example of what they're doing here in Costa Rica they have been tracking every single case. Uh, identifying it, uh, isolating people, and, and doing contact tracing uh, since the very beginning beginning of the pandemic. And there's no secret that these uh, this is uh, the recommended way to uh, for governments in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so those countries that are doing this, uh, like Taiwan or New Zealand or uh, Uruguay or you know, Costa Rica, um, have better results in terms of infections. Now. And from the chart that uh, Rigo showed, you, sh you saw that sometimes you have, in, in a given particular day, uh, the government is applying, let's say, uh, or the authorities are applying 2,000 tests. Uh, and 80% of those tests are positive. That is a metric, like the proportion of positive cases uh, related to the, um, to the number of tests applied could be used as how serious the situation is, 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 is going or how is it evolving. But on the other hand, you have to understand that, uh, uh, let me give you a concrete example. You know, if you have a factory uh, uh, that became a focus of infection, uh, so you discover that there was an, an employee or a party or whatever event. Uh, so what, what they have to do is immediately go and test everybody or all the family members, all the employees working in this factory. Uh, and so it's very likely that those tests performed this day, uh, you're gonna have a high percentage of positives because you're, you're targeting precisely the, the, this cluster and trying to understand it. So uh, you understand that it's better to understand the numbers in the context of what's happening in real life. Because remember the data is just an X-ray of the moment a representation but the underlying reasons uh, are, could only be explained by understanding the entire context and the measures that we're taking. I think we have a lot more questions, but we're starting to run out of time. So I think, um, Madge, why don't you give us another round and maybe we could keep the answers a bit shorter. And, um, uh, but it's very complex. So um, you need to say what you need to say, uh, Madge. Yeah, I have two in-depth story, uh, in-depth questions, and other you know basic questions. Um, uh, the two uh, in-depth question for Rig: uh, What uh, correlation are you seeing between obesity and COVID deaths in your stories? This is the first uh, question. The second one: How does this happen that Mexico and Colombia can provide all the huge data, and other countries do not? Um, okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, did you have another one, Madge? Yeah, uh, also people ask, you know, about math and data to be able to produce these stories, what, what math skills should we get or, or have, and the basic data skills that we should uh, obtain to implement data stories. Gosh, that's a lot of questions, but they're good ones. Um, let's do those and then I'm afraid we, I think we've run out of time. So the first one was on obesity and the effect, yeah? So I don't know who wants to take that, Giannina or Rodrigo? Uh, Rigo, maybe you can look at it. Yesterday, well, Rigo looked for the information. Is uh, obesity and what else? What else? Age or what? Uh, and deaths, you know, the, the yeah, no, the, the yeah, it's uh, correlation uh, with death. Yeah, yeah. 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 So what? Go Sorry. Ahead, yeah. Um, the algorithm that I'm using requires a parameter that is the 
uh, minimum uh, confidence and uh, the minimum probability required. Uh, so I, I set um, uh, as minimum 20% uh, 20, 20 of probability. So if uh, the obesity is not in this light, it's because um, the probability is less than the 20%. So yeah, this is this is not a, a a high high risk factor. Great, thank you well, for that. Was, okay. The next yeah. one was on why Colombia, countries like Colombia and Mexico, can give out so much granular data, and no, and other countries don't seem able to do it. And what your response to uh, that? Yeah, well, I wish I had the answer. We've been uh, Rigo, Rigo and I have been trying uh, for weeks already to collect granular data from other regions. I mean, like individual records of people infected. Uh, surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, actually this is happening in, in you know, I've, um, I've, I've worked in many countries around the world and I constantly, mon uh, you know, monitoring the data available uh, and more and more Latin America has become a, a, a region that produces open data, um, uh, like like the one we're seeing uh, same with uh, trade uh, information it's also available in the same countries uh now the thing like I, I guess the lesson with this is now that we know that this could be done and that there's no problem we're not identifying these people uh you can ask and demand this kind of information to you from from your government so um uh, and we would be super uh, uh, we would like to hear from you if, if there are many other countries doing the same thing but this is the idea now unfortunately there are no standards and this is something I forgot to mention there are no global standards as for governments on how to deal with data and what kind of data uh, they should produce to better understand this pandemic so each country is doing whatever they um, and so that's why it's important. I mean, the activism part of uh, open data and data journalism would be demanding from the governments that this, the more granular data. Now, there's something else I have to say. So uh, can you use the Mexican data and extrapolate if you, uh, we were trying to do that with my case yesterday, using the algorithm to see, you know, drag and drop and see, okay, I have this and this like in the supermarket, hypertension and this and that. Uh, okay, what's the probability for me to get infected? Uh, can I use, uh, I don't know, data from Sweden? Uh, well, no, guess what? This is just a probability based on the data because there are so many other re reasons, you know, nutrition, um, life expectancy, it varies in different countries. So you have already underlying conditions, uh, you know, if you exercise or not, and so there are many other variables. Uh, and now we have learned, you know, this pandemic, it's, it's in, in prison. This week we have learned and confirmed that the blood type is another variable. So apparently people with A, uh, blood type A are more, uh, have O positive uh, blood type. So again, there are many other variables that were not integrated. So this is not like a, an accurate calculation of, okay, I mean, in, in my case, it was like 22%. <laughs> Uh, but but again, uh, it's just uh, it's just some way to to understand how uh, now the ideal world will be having granular data for every country. This is the way we would understand definitely definitely how, how this pandemic is affecting people across countries. But yeah, hopefully we will get there at some point. I think that might be a good place to end, and I'm really sorry to the people whose questions we didn't have time for, but. Uh, I think that all the rich material and the examples and all the data sets um, are in the material that we've circulated. And, um, you know, this isn't going to be our last webinar on data. So maybe come back with your questions. But we have really run out of time. So again, I apologize to everyone who couldn't, whose questions couldn't be addressed here. And, um, but I really want to thank uh, everyone. It's been a great webinar and it's uh, been so interesting the data is right at the heart of this story, absolutely essential. So I think we've all I've really learned a lot. Um, and I want to 
thank everyone involved, um, the great team at GIJN for all their help, and also to the translators who you can't see, but we're working hard behind the scenes. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the audience uh, for, for joining us. It's, uh, we're uh, grateful to have you and thanks for joining. And most of all, I'd really like to thank um, Rigoberto and Giannina for all their incredible work to prepare for this webinar and all the fascinating insights they've given us and resources to keep going with the story. So thank you all very much. And before I end, I just want to um, invite the audience to join us next week. We have another webinar at the same time next week. Uh, this time it's on uh, COVID-19 disinformation with uh, Craig Silverman, who's from BuzzFeed and one of the world's leading experts on online misinformation. And he will be joined by a colleague, uh, Jose Antonio Lima uh, from Comprova in Brazil, which um, uh, it will be very interesting, I hope. So thank you all very much. Thank you again to Giannina and Rigoberto and uh, have a, good, a great week, everyone. Thanks a lot from GIJN. Bye. <laughs>